Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring the chakra system of ancient and modern India. My guest is my good friend, Debashish Banerjee, who has been a guest on New Thinking Aloud many times in the past. Today, he is in Kolkata, India. Debashish is the Haridas Chowdhury Professor of Indian Philosophies and Cultures, and he's also the Doshi Professor of Asian Art at the California Institute of Integral Studies where he is additionally the program chair of the East-West Psychology Department. He is the author of The Alternate Nation of Abhinindranath Tagore, Seven Quartets of Becoming, a transformative yoga psychology based on the diaries of Sri Aurobindo, Integral Yoga Psychology, Metaphysics and Transformation as Taught by Sri Aurobindo, and Meditations on the Isa Upanishad. In addition, he has edited Rabindranath Tagore in the 21st Century and Critical Posthumanism and Planetary Futures. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Debashish. What a pleasure to connect with you halfway across the world. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's always a pleasure talking to you. So, we'll be discussing the uh, chakras today, and uh, I know that it's a very ancient system. Uh, it's very interesting that I think many of our viewers will be familiar with the chakras. When I was much younger, almost nobody knew about them, and now they're sort of part of common parlance uh, these days. But uh, in India, the uh, system has been around probably in, in many different forms for a very long time. I'm guessing thousands of years. Uh, yes, uh, Jeffrey, we are really not sure how uh, old the system is, but it could very well go back to uh, the earliest layers of Indian civilization. Uh, the Indus Valley may already have had the idea of the chakras, in fact, that's something that I've argued based on the seals of, of the Indus Valley. And those themselves, because the Indus Valley was already an urban civilization, they may represent a carryover from a forest-dwelling uh, nomadic people. So it's very possible that uh, what we are seeing with the Indus Valley seals is the chakra earliest representations of the chakra system that were already present in uh, uh, Aboriginal and uh, forest uh, dweller communities prior to 3000 BC. We should define uh, the term chakras. Uh, it probably yeah, has a different meaning in India than I think people in the United States or uh, Western countries would think of. The term chakra, Jeffrey, literally means circle. It means circle or it can mean uh, uh, something that rotates. And uh, chakras are nodes along the spine and actually not really the spine. The spine is the physical correlate of a subtle anatomy. They use the word sukshma, which means subtle uh, anatomy that uh, corresponds to what we may call the spine. So, in fact, the spine, which is a bony structure, is itself considered to be a, a materialization or material uh, manifestation of a, 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 a axis. Uh, you know, as the human being stands up, becomes a, a kind of a, 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 an animal that stands, uh, it is as if uh, there is a vertical line between heaven and earth that is formed, that is represented by the spine. And so this axis is a subtle axis that contains some steps, one may say. These steps are the nodes 
that are considered to be circles or chakras. I have heard many different uh, versions or variations or interpretations. Uh, back in 1972, I sponsored a symposium in, in Berkeley with Ramurti Mishra, the uh, medical doctor, who was a yoga teacher and a guru, and and he correlated the chakras to the endocrine glands, for example. There's a long tradition of doing that. It's, it's, uh, I think it's a modern uh, sort of correlation, but there has been an ancient correlation between organs and uh, glands and uh, the physical anatomy and the astral or subtle anatomy for a long time. Uh, this correlation with the endocrine glands, uh, I feel that it begins with the theosophists. But uh, you have a variety of uh, Indian schools that uh, quickly translate that into their own systems as well. Now, the theosophists would, would be 19th century. That's right, yes. And of course, Sir John Woodruff, a uh, Western scholar who, who lived in India, wrote the uh, book, The Serpent Power. I read it when I was an undergraduate in, in college uh, at a time when nobody knew about the chakras, uh, at least in my circle uh, in those days. But uh, it, I gather that Sir John Woodruff did a, a great deal to introduce the notion of the chakras into the English-speaking world. No doubt, no doubt, Jeffrey. I think that uh, book that you're talking about, The Serpent Power, is one of the first uh, really scholarly expositions. And uh, what he does there is he translates an important 16th century uh, text uh, called the Shat Chakra Nirupana. Uh, and that means th th that's actually talking about six chakras that itself is a, a, a kind of variation from the seven chakra system. So it's often believed that uh, there were originally six chakras or even less and more, but the six was the most standard number. And then we moved to a seven chakra system. And uh, so that's what he's translating over there. And our present day understanding of chakras you know, uh, chakras have uh, numbers of petals and uh, they have colors and they have deities, they have animals, they have sounds. All this really uh, standard understanding comes from that book. Uh, so, you know, today you have all kinds of books, you have Wikipedia entries. As you said, it's, it's common knowledge to the new age. And it's really all following after those descriptions in the Shat Chakra Nirupana. But if you go to, you know, a, a, any particular tantric uh, group or sect, you'll find that oftentimes they are not the same number of chakras. They are also not the same number of uh, petals, uh, the, not the same deities. Uh, so there are variations, many, many variations of the system. But today, uh, we often talk about the seven s chakras uh, and their uh, characteristics that have come from the Shat Chakra Nirup Nirupana and John Woodruff's work. One way I like to think of the chakras is that they are the uh, result of introspection, of inward vision, meditating on one's own spirit or soul or inner awareness. Uh, and there's, it's a kind of, as you point out, subtle anatomy that they, uh, although there's a lot of symbolism, it, it also represents something potentially structural in uh, the uh, mind-body system. Yes, indeed, there must be a, a kind of a structure so that uh, original uh, visions, experiences relating to the anatomy uh, must have translated into this understanding. So even when we look at the variations, we find uh, some uh, parallels. You know, some systems are talking just about four chakras. For example, some of the Tibetan systems talk about four, uh, which are what in the other system are the navel chakra, the heart chakra, the throat chakra, 
and the crown chakra. And some talk about five. So, but the reason I made that connection between the other system is that there is a certain kind of parallelism between the six or seven that we ordinarily see and the other systems. So, apart from the six or seven, there are systems that talk about intermediate chakras. So there's a chakra, for example, some systems are looking at at the palatal region. And then there's a chakra below the heart chakra that several systems are looking at that is connected with the heart chakra, but is more related to what is in, in the Western parlance known as the soul uh, or the inner Atman, the Antar Atman. So you have these uh, as part of the seven chakra with subsidiary chakras. But then you have uh, chakras that extend beyond the seven chakras. For example, one question that we have to ask is that the seven chakras are stopping at the, at the root chakra below the spine, partly because the legs are folded. People are sitting down. And even from uh, the Indus Valley, we see the yogi that is really sitting on his toes and pushing at the perineum to push up the kundalini. But uh, some scholars, uh, in fact, a student of mine has uh, argued that if we really look at some of the evidence, uh, dance systems, for example, are talking about a standing body asana system. And if you're, if you're standing, not sitting with the legs crossed and moving, then uh, you have uh, other active chakras below the root chakra. So they're talking about at least two more chakras, one at the level of the knees and another at the level of the ankles. Uh, so they're talking about uh, nine chakras. And then uh, if we're talking about the crown chakra, we'll see that even inside the crown chakra, there are levels. Usually the crown chakra is related to samadhi or deep trance, but there are layers or levels of deep trance. And then depending on the school, they actually recognize those as other chakras. So depending on the numerology, uh, you know, you could have seven or you could have 12. That is uh, nine chakras, including the ones below the, uh, the root and then three above, uh, you know, a 12 chakra system. Uh, and, and so on. I mean, there's, there's some that are talking about seven above the crown, seven below the, you know, the, the, the root, and seven uh, as we can generally operate. So they're talking about uh, three sevens. And so these are, these are interesting systems, but you're right about the structural aspect that there must have been and there must be uh, a very ancient correlation through experience and uh, vision of uh, what we know as the seven chakras. I know it's the chakra system is also embedded in other systems as well, the nadis and other channels rising up and down, energy coming up from the earth, energy coming down from the sky. And plus there's this notion of sheaths that uh, you refer to the astral body or the subtle body. But uh, I understand there, there could be seven or more sheaths, uh, each one having its own uh, anatomy. and. I also recall Professor William Tiller, who was a Stanford University professor, gave a lecture on this, I heard, back in 1973, in which he referred to the chakras as transducers, that they bring energy from these different subtle levels into the physical level. Yes, uh, Jeffrey, very, very right. And so talking about the sheets, for example, uh, you know, the, 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 the metaphysics gets more and more complicated as we move in history. And, uh, you know, it's very possible that when we go back to the Indus Valley, these chakras were purely energy uh, systems. They were part of a, a, a power dynamic 
that one looked at when uh, when Christ, you, you know, the earliest uh, evidence that I think uh, exists is the seal that shows a yogi that is sitting on his toes and he's uh, sitting, he has three heads, uh, horns, he wears horns, uh, he has an erect penis and he, his head is surrounded by animals. And it's, it, the, the, there are four power animals. Uh, there is the gaur buffalo, which is not, not the domesticated uh, bovine animal, but the, the, the wild buffalo. Uh, there's the rhino. Uh, there is the tiger. And uh, there is uh, uh, the elephant. And uh, below the seat of this, of this yogi, there are two either goats or deer. So these animals, these particularly the wild predator animals or the dangerous animals of the forest uh, could very well be a, a memory of our life in the forest and, and the idea that individuals had to generate an independent power to, uh, to live in the world of the animals. And these might have very well be the, been the origin of practices to develop power uh, through the, the chakras. And uh, you, you, so the, later what we find is this notion of uh, three bodies or five bodies. The Taittiriya Upanishad is talking about five bodies. Uh, the four nature, uh, sorry, the three nature bodies, the bodies that we normally operate, are uh, the physical body, which is called the body of food, Annamaya Kosha, uh, the life body called the Pranamaya Kosha, and the mind body called the Manumaya Kosha. And these bodies are related to the chakras. So uh, we have one chakra, which is the root chakra that is connected with, uh, it's the center of the food body, with the, the, the physical anatomy. Uh, the three chakras above that, which are the sex center, the navel center, and the heart center, are connected with the life body, the bo they are animal selves, you may say. And the mind body, uh, Manumaya Kosha, uh, is related to the throat chakra, the eyebrow chakra, and the crown chakra. And then you have, uh, you know, the Tathiriya Upanishad talks about two more. That is the Vigyana Maya Kosha and the Ananda Maya Kosha. These are the cosmic sheaths. And uh, if this, these have chakras, then they would be above the crown chakra. The chakras are also very much involved with the uh, goddess, the female energy. Uh, sometimes uh, Kundalini, for example, is part of the chakra system and, and is referred to as the goddess Shakti moving through the body. Absolutely, uh, Jeffrey. I think that's, that's a very important connection. And again, going back to the Indus Valley, the other very important uh, seal shows us a sacrifice scene. And in the sacrifice scene, you see a goddess uh, who's going to sacrifice a ram, a uh, very large looking ram, uh, to what looks like a pitcher, but the pitcher is made up of uh, plant uh, uh, stems. It's a plant pitcher. And there's a figure suspended inside that. And underneath uh, this uh, sacrifice scene are seven small female figures. And there are two seals. One of them shows six and the other shows seven. And so these might very well be the goddesses of the chakras. And if you look at the Shat uh, Chakra Nirupana, uh, it talks about the goddesses. This is how the word Dakini uh, that has become so popular in Tibetan Tantrism uh, arises out of this system. Uh, these seven goddesses uh, have names like Dakini, Lakini, Hakini, Rakini, etc. Kakini. They all relate to sound syllables because each one of the, f the first uh, sound is a, a, a mantric, uh, is, is a seed syllable. 
uh, mantra seed syllable. That's what gives them their names. The term that has become really common in the new age from Tibetan tantrism, Dakini, is really the foundation of these, these figures. Uh, the goddess of the Muladhara of the root chakra is Dakini. And uh, so we find that uh, each one of these chakras is really inhabited by a, a goddess, a Shakti. And underneath this entire system is the coiled energy of the Kundalini. The Kundalini is a Shakti, uh, often represented as a snake or serpent. And then we find that in early Indian literature and art, you, you see earth serpents called Nagas. Uh, the Kundalini is a microcosmic representation of the macrocosmic uh, coiled energy of the earth, which is, which is the, uh, the Naga. And then above the entire system, there is Shakti that is descending from above. And so in a very interesting uh, art panel from the 6th century in Mahabalipuram, um, today known as Mamalapuram, you see uh, the story of the descent of the Ganga, or the Ganges, you know, the Ganga descending from above uh, due to the yogi uh, Bhagirath, who, who is actually in a standing posture, uh, and uh, the Ganga descends a, 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 down a cleft in the, in the mountain. And uh, from below, there are these wriggling Nagas that are traveling up. And so it's really the two currents from above and below which form an earlier kind of Tantra. Tantra was not just the rise of the Kundalini. It was uh, the meeting of two currents, the current from heaven coming below and the current from earth rising above. And I gather that the uh, idea of these two currents is also expressed in, in the yantra or the geometrical shapes associated with uh, the chakras. Quite true, Jeffrey. So we find, uh, you know, the, all the geometric shape, shapes of yantras. The word yantra, by the way, means instrument or engine. And so these are engines of becoming. You know, we have a goal of becoming. Uh, what are we going to become? And then we create an engine for becoming that. And actually, the chakra system itself is an engine for becoming. It's really, uh, that's why we have so many systems. Uh, what differentiates these systems? If you really look at it, they all have different goals. Some uh, prioritize a goal of immortality. Some will prioritize a goal of certain powers, siddhis. Uh, some will prioritize a goal of, uh, of lib moksha, uh, 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 liberation, samadhi. So depending on the, the goal, you have uh, special chakras and you have special configurations of the chakras. And what uh, the chakras are used in is a exercise called nyasa, which means establishment of the divine body. And it's done by uh, meditating on the properties of the chakras at the various uh, anatomical points of the chakra to establish the divine energies and open up those energies at those places so that one... Uh, arrives at the physical yantra, the body becomes a yantra uh, that uh, takes us an, as an instrument to become what, what our goal of becoming is. Th that's how the system works. So in addition to uh, the goddesses, there are also uh, male deities associated uh, with the chakras. Yes, indeed, uh, Jeffrey. So there are male deities. Each chakra has a presiding deity. And then they also, each chakra has a pair, a duality, uh, a male and female uh, pair, a consort pair. And these consort pairs uh, go, and the, the, the female is the one that we mentioned. They are all uh, shaktis, but each one of them has a, a purusha which is a, a male counterpart. And the difference between male and female is, is a very ancient one in India. So metaphorically, it is a differentiation between being and energy, or presence and energy. 
so the the male is the is is the presence is the uh, being and uh, the shakti is the energy and uh, the union of the two is really the operation of the uh, the, the the integral it's the integral reality of being and becoming we may say so uh, we find that this is represented uh, through the entire system and often it is uh, variations of Shiva and uh, Shakti. Shiva and the Shiva Shakti system could very well have been the original tantric system. Uh, now in the Shat uh, Chakra Nirupana, for example, some of the male gods are not Shiva. You have Brahma at the root level, you have Vishnu at the uh, second chakra level, uh, and then you have different forms of Shiva from the heart level onwards, uh, right up to the, the sub-levels of the, of, of the crown chakra. So these are polarities, uh, Jeffrey. And the entire system in chakra has to do with the balancing and union of polarities. The polarity of heaven and earth and the polarity of being and becoming. And this is at different levels, uh, this, un this is understood differently so that uh, we can operate uh, this polarity depending on how we configure it. Uh, some uh, tantras are uh, configured around the sex center. So there is, uh, uh, you know, what, what is common now in understanding tantra in the West is uh, are these sexual systems. But that is only one particular layer where the polarity is seen as the physical union of the male and the female. But there are other ways in which other chakras are privileged and other polarities are engaged to become the primary engine uh, of the yantra. I have seen uh, some images uh, from you of uh, the male deity is prone, lying flat on the ground. The female is sitting upright on top of the male. It suggests that the, the male is immobile. It's being, not acting, whereas uh, the, the female energy is, seems to be necessary for action in the world. Absolutely, uh, Jeffrey. So I think the entire tantric system is really based on uh, the power of the female and the female as a, a energy source. And so the male is just a passive or inert presence. Uh, you know, in some several tantras, they use the analogy of Shava. Shava means corpse. And the term Shiva which is the name of, uh, you know, the male uh, counterpart of, of Shakti, is uh, seen as Shava, uh, in other words, corpse. That's why he's shown lying supine, prone. Uh, until Shakti, you know, which is uh, characterized by the sound syllable E, you see the, the sound, the vowel E, the long E, uh, I, uh, which is pronounced E, uh, is considered the quintessential sound of the Shakti. All the Sanskrit words that end with the long E are feminine words. So when E dances on the corpse, on Shava, it becomes Shiva, you see. So this is how the Tantric system is really a power em em empowerment of uh, the corpse of presence, uh, so that it becomes the being that can operate in the world. And, and I gather each of the chakras has a unique syllable. Absolutely. Each chakra has one unique syllable for the chakra. Uh, you know, as I said, there, there are syllables like yam, ram, lam, uh, sounds like that. And then uh, the chakras, uh, we use the term circle for chakras. They are circles or circular, but they are often thought of as lotuses. So they are like uh, closed buds of a flower. And uh, when the flower opens, uh, each petal, each chakra has a different number of petals. 
each petal is a property or characteristic of the chakra. And each petal has a specific sound syllable that is related to that property. So you have a number of sounds, one central sound, but a number of subsidiary sounds around that central sound. It's like a buzz of the chakra. It, it's a whole orchestra by the time you uh, finish. It's an entire orchestra. In fact, it's the entire alphabet uh, resonating together. That's why, uh, you know, one of Woodruff's uh, books is called The Garland of Letters. Uh, I don't know if you came across that. And that's, uh, you know, Kali who wears the garland of skulls. Uh, each skull is supposed to be actually a sound syllable. So she's wearing the garland of letters and it's the entire alphabet. The Sanskrit alphabet is considered to be uh, mantric. So each, each sound of the Sanskrit uh, alphabet is organized according to uh, specific chakric uh, systems so that they have uh, properties uh, that are, uh, uh, are, are mystical sounds. And also each chakra has a particular color in, in many of the diagrams that I've seen. Is, is that also traditional? Most of the standard colors that we see are coming out of this Shat Chakra Nirupana and other 16th century texts. Uh, and they are standardized, but there are other color uh, combinations depending on the school you go to. But indeed, they all have colors. So it's really a audio-visual system. It's really engaging the eyes and the ears uh, in their imaginary, you know, uh, or what, what Corbin would have called the imaginal it's really the imaginal, the imaginal reconstruction through a holistic sound system, a holistic sense systems, synesthetic systems, you know, because it's, it's sound and co color and image at the same time trying to trigger a sense that goes behind all the senses. Well, I can imagine that students of, of these traditions will spend years studying all of the nuances. Indeed, they do. And uh, so the, the, the really advanced students, uh, some of them in, in Tibetan Tantra, and e even uh, for that matter, Shakta Tantra, uh, who are practicing Nyasa, which is the establishment of a divine body, uh, go into great visualization detail, detail of visualization with each one of these. And they are not restricted to the seven. They start with the seven and then extend other chakras throughout the body. And it's not just the spine. It's the knuckles, the, the, the knees, the ankles, and every part of the body has a number of deities and nodes of this kind with characters. So it's a very detailed divine anatomy that they re-establish, they establish in themselves through visualization and uh, connecting with these uh, properties of the, uh, 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 of the goddesses and uh, the chakras. So we've described a, a sort of a development of the chakra system going back to the Indus Valley culture and working its way through the different tantric schools, through Buddhism and uh, through the uh, 16th century manuscript uh, and uh, the work of Sir John Woodruff. Has there been ongoing development uh, subsequently? Tantra could have been a stream on its own that ultimately came and integrated with almost all the Indian systems. And so now you have a Hindu Tantra, a Buddhist Tantra, a number of uh, different uh, Tantras, Vaishnav Tantra, uh, Shakta Tantra, Shaiva Tantra, uh, Buddhist Tantra, Jaina Tantra. These have all developed over time with different aims. And so they use the same vocabulary, the same methods, but they are geared towards different goals. And also these shaktis, how they interact, uh, have varied uh, over time. 
So for example, I mentioned the two uh, currents, the current from above and the current from below. And the ancient systems all were focused uh, much more on the current from below because the idea was that uh, the higher chakras, the chakra above the head, for example, the crown chakra was uh, completely closed. And uh, we couldn't really operate from that chakra. The whole idea was that we had to awaken the kundalini from below and it would shoot up the spine and go to sleep in the crown chakra in a deep samadhi. And many of the schools, particularly the liberatory schools, uh, were focused in the Buddhist schools or Advaita Vedanta, for example, that has also incorporated uh, Tantra into its system. They are into how deep a trance can one get to through, through these. Uh, but uh, you have other views on the matter as, uh, you know, that, uh, that uh, image I, sh I was speaking about uh, from Mamalapuram. Uh, that image itself is a sign of the fact that some schools are thinking that it's possible to open up uh, the flow of energy from above. And uh, modern yogis uh, like Sri Aurobindo, for example, uh, believe that there has been an evolution of consciousness over time. And one of the things that we can see today is that our understanding of, of the mind has increased a lot more. We have universal understanding to a much greater extent. The very fact that we are having this conversation uh, and then the new age and the way in which theosophy came in and brought all the schools of spirituality uh, into comparative study uh, you know, this, this has opened up a certain universal realm of mind. And uh, Sri Aurobindo was to say that in an esoteric and occult way, what that means is that what we call the thousand petaled lotus is much more active right now than ever before. It's, it's as if the, the petals are stirring. And so uh, it's possible for us, instead of trying to wake up the kundalini from below, that's a very difficult process and requires a guru because of the sudden unpredictable surge of energy that takes place uh, that can often create uh, trauma and psychosis. Uh, that it's possible to open to the shakti flowing from above descending, which is a much more, uh, uh, a slower process, but also a much more enlightening process that creates greater uh, peace. And as it comes down, it opens up the chakras and causes the kundalini energy to gradually rise instead of that sudden rise to meet the energy descending from above. So this is an interesting uh, idea that relates to our time because evolutionarily, certain things are possible now that were not possible before. You know, many years ago, I interviewed uh, Joseph Campbell, the great uh, scholar of mythology, and uh, he was very, very positive about the chakra system. He, he said you could take pretty much all the schools of Western psychology and integrate them into the chakra system, uh, that uh, it's capable of encompassing uh, almost all of Western thought. You have Freud at the sexual chakra and Adler at the power chakra and then the heart chakra and Jung up at the third eye uh, chakra. And I imagine uh, transpersonal psychology might be related to the thousand petaled lotus chakra and the behavioral psychologies could be related to the throat chakra. That's such a wonderful insight. It's, it's such a true insight. And I think uh, that's exactly, uh, you know, how the, the chakras relate to our psychology. They, they are, each one of them is a, a opening to a different aspect of human psychology. And I feel that uh, in our times, we are moving towards an integral image of the, of the human. We talk about whole person psychology, for example. 
a whole person psychology would actually integrate all of these, would look to integrate all of these. And uh, uh, that the tantra of this kind would play a very important role in, uh, in f fostering a whole person psychology. Debashish Banerjee, I know we've just scratched the surface of a very vast and ancient system, but this has been a, a great joy. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to speak with you uh, so far away in Kolkata. And uh, I hope that we have many more conversations because I know uh, there's so much more to talk about. Yes, thank you, Jeffrey. In fact, uh, you're right. We're talking from Kolkata. It's just the end of the 10-day cycle of the divine Durga. And in fact, that, that in itself uh, is part of this talk about the goddess that we, we just had, because uh, the 10-day cycle relates to nine forms of Durga, or some people talk about 10 forms of Durga, and they may be 10 chakras, another of these systems that we are talking about. So indeed, it's, it's a very rich uh, subject that uh, uh, pervades our inner life. Debashish, thank you so much for being with me. And for those of you watching, thank you for being with us.